Inshallah, I'd like to share with you a few sections of the Quran and instead of sharing with you detailed accounts of a number of Sahaba, I'll share with you the, uh, the accounts of one particular Sahabi that we can draw specific lessons from, inshallah. But before I do, I'd like to share with you another type of Sahabi, a different type of companion. Not one that's a role model, but that one that's, that you would look down upon. We find in the Quran another messenger mentioned and his companions mentioned in detail. And the amazing thing is because these are people that have passed, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to the sons of Israel at the time of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa but he speaks to them in second person. Okay, wadkuru. And you know, ni'matallahi alaykum, right? If ja'atkum Musa bil bayyinat, when Musa came upon you. Now notice he didn't come on them, who did he come on? He came on their forefathers. But he speaks of them in the second person only to make it highlighted just as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks to those who have iman. Ya ayyuha alladheena amanu is also in second person. All those of you who believe. So all of those ayat you find in second person, particularly in Surah Baqarah. And so I'd like to begin with the negative and move towards the positive, inshaAllah ta'ala. For many, for all of us, we have not seen Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And for the sahaba that were seeing him, they had not seen Allah. They had not seen miracles from the sky or anything supernatural, save a few of them who saw some particular incidents that we can pinpoint. But for these specific companions of Musa والسلام, imagine this, you're about to be executed by a tyrant ruler, you're lost in the desert with this man who promises that he can save you, and you're crying to him saying, you, you, prob- you lied to us, here's the army, it's coming upon us to destroy us, and you brought us in the middle of this desert to be slaughtered like sheep. And he strikes his staff and a body of water parts and you walk right through it. If you were an atheist before or if you were just tagging, tagging along for the ride before thinking, hey, maybe he's right, maybe he's wrong, I'll take my chances. If I stay in Egypt, then I'm for sure I'll be slaughtered. So notice in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't say, وَلَن نُؤْمِنَ بِكَ the, the Bani Israel don't say, we're not going to believe you. They say, وَلَن نُؤْمِنَ لَكَ نُؤْمِنُ بِي and نُؤْمِنَ لَا Big difference. 
Nu'minu bi is to believe in, to confirm that he brought the truth. Nu'minu la, that in the Arabic terminology refers to to accept. will go along with what you're saying. The same thing Fir'aun said to Musa a.s. He said, I'm not going to let them go. And he said, I, when, when an, Nu'mina laka, the chiefs of Fir'aun said, We're not going to accept what you're saying. Your demands are to let these people go. We're not going to accept what you're saying. Their statement wasn't, we're not going to believe in you. That they had already given as a statement before. We're not going to believe in you no matter what. So the point was now to accept what he's saying. To follow him. So among the Bani Israel, there are those who might have been in doubt. Maybe this guy's crazy. Maybe he's, maybe he's right. Maybe he's wrong. Why not take our chances? Because for sure we're going to die here. They go, they see a body of water part. They pass right through it. And that Fir'aun who they saw people make sajda to, that Fir'aun that armies used to crumble before him, they saw him perish before their own eyes. So if nothing else made you believe in Allah before that, and if it didn't make you take Musa salam seriously before that, I would think this incident would open your eyes. Right? This is a pretty big thing to, to watch, to see a body of water just open up. Now you're in the middle of the desert, and the first thing that human beings will suffer in the desert is dehydration. So you, wherever you're traveling with Musa, وَظَلَّلْنَا عَلَيْكُمُ الْغَمَامِ And we shaded upon you a cloud, the cloud. This al-ghamam used to follow them wherever they went. Now imagine that, you're in the desert, you're stranded, you're going to dehydrate out of the heat, but there's a, there's a cloud following you, offering you shade and offering you water. وَأَنزَلْنَا عَلَيْكُمُ الْمَنَّ وَالسَّلْوَى Now in the, in the desert, first of all, to have plantation, that you can get bread out of is next to impossible. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends men. Then He sends salwa upon them. And men came through rain, which is miraculous in and of itself. But salwa, the natural instinct for any bird, if you try to catch it, is to do what? Just to fly off. But these salwa, they used to come, they're described in most of the tafsir as the likes of quails. They would come in herds. They would come in packs. And they would just sit there at night waiting for themselves to be caught. Free food, literally. وَظَلَّلْنَا عَلَيْكُمُ الْغَمَامِ Free shading, free covering, lodging. Right? And now, manna in salwat. And then Allah says, كُلُوا بِن طَيِّبَاتِ مَا رَزَقْنَا Go eat freely what we have provided you. Go ahead, eat, enjoy. Not only did we save you from someone you had no chance of saving yourselves, not only did we bring you out of the darkness of shirk, whatever misguidance you were in, we brought you a messenger who has guidance with him, now you get all this free stuff. So if you weren't a believer before then, you would think, hey, okay, I see, you've seen a lot of stuff now. You would, be, you would really believe. Let's top it all off. Now, Musa leaves you for a little while and you get tricked by somebody. Let's give them benefit of the doubt. Somebody makes a, a statue of a, a golden cap and he makes passages through it so when the wind blows, it makes a sound. So people, and he convinces them that this is God and they start worshipping it. So when Musa a.s. comes back, he gets angry at Harun. You all know the story, right? Alayhi salam. He gets angry at Harun alayhi salam. Said, "What did you do? In my absence?" So he says, "I, I didn't have authority over them like you do." And I, the example that my teacher gave me in this regard, in Surah Araf, when this incident is mentioned in some detail, is you know you have a teacher in class. The teacher's keeping the class in control. Everybody's sitting in their seat, quiet, doing their work. He says, "I'll be back in five minutes." And he puts a class monitor, some kid, some nerdy kid from the back of the class. You're in charge. Five minutes. Make sure nobody talks. As soon as he leaves, that nerdy kid's getting paper thrown at his face, people are chewing gum, people are yelling and screaming, some people are pulling his shirt, people are doing all kinds of things because he doesn't have the same authority as the teacher did. Even though he was delegated authority by the teacher himself. Harun a.s. is also a prophet, but he's not a messenger, he's not a rasul like Musa a.s. He doesn't have the authority of Musa a.s. Another reason he doesn't have the authority of Musa a.s. is because Musa was brought up in the family, in the lineage of... Fir'aun, so he knew how to control people. He, he had that, that, that uh, legacy. But Harun Islam was brought with the oppressed people, he was raised among them. So there's a big difference in, in the way of leadership between the two. But in any ways, he comes back, what's going on here? They refer the matter to Allah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveal just in hint in the Qur'an, we find details in tafsir, but in the Qur'an we find very brief account, particularly in Surah Baqarah. Okay? وَإِذْ آتَيْنَا مُوسَى الْكِتَابِ وَالْفُرْقَانَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَهْتَدُونَ When we gave Musa the book and the criterion so that you can be guided. And the immediate next ayah is وَإِذْ قَالَ مُوسَى لِقَوْمِهِ يَا قَوْمِ إِنَّكُمْ ظَلَمْتُمْ أَنفُسَكُمْ O my قوم, you have done injustice against yourselves by taking the calf as something to worship. So make tawbah to your Rabb, فَتُوبُوا إِلَى بَارِئِكُمْ فَاقْتُلُوا أَنفُسَكُمْ Then kill yourselves. The ayah doesn't mean commit suicide, it means 
There are 12 tribes of Israel. For every tribe, the people that started worshipping the calf, if you're a Muslim and you do shirk, you left the state of Islam, so the punishment of murtad is execution, which is not something initiated in the law of Muhammad wasallam, but it was actually started in the sharia of Musa wasallam. It's continued in the law of Rasulullah wasallam. So now this command comes. Now notice, it's the same Musa who they saw with the permission of Allah parting a body of water, having a cloud follow them, manna and salwa, all of that good stuff. And they look at him in his face and they say, وَقَالُوا لَن نُؤْمِنَ لَكَ حَتَّى نَرَ اللَّهَ جَهْرَ And they said, we're not going to believe in you until we see Allah face to face. You're telling us this? And it's not believe in you, I mistranslated. نُؤْمِنَ لَكَ Again, we're not going to accept what you're saying until we see Allah face to face. Then Allah says, فَأَخَذَتْكُمُ الصَّاعِقَةِ وَأَنْتُمْ تَنْظُرُونَ Then an explosion, it seized you and all of you died immediately. While you were watching, before your eyes, an explosion came, it took them. ثُمَّ بَعَثْنَاكُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَوْتِكُمْ Then He raised you from death. لَعَلَّكُمْ تَشْكُرُونَ So that now you can thank Allah. Now you can be like, okay, well, okay, fine, we'll do what you say. Right? But even then, there are so many other problems that are mentioned later on. So if you went through this, you got killed by Allah, and He raised you back to life, you would think, now you would believe. You have no rational excuse to disbelieve, or to, to sway in your belief. You'd be the best of believers. Because you've seen miracle after miracle after miracle. Last one I'll mention, because there's many more. Last one I'll mention. Allah mentions this three times in Surah Baqarah. In these ten rukur, Allah mentions this one particularly three times. Because it's the craziest one. Like it baffles your mind. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِذْ أَخَذْنَا مِيثَاقَكُمْ وَرَفَعْنَا فَوْقَكُمُ الطُّورِ When Allah took a covenant for, from you, and to make you realize how important these commandments are, this covenant, this law is, he raised the mountain of Tur in the air. So there's a mountain hovering in the air where you're standing below it. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Hold on to what I have given you with all of your might. Two places. In one, in, in the exact same words, Allah says, Hold on to what I've given you with all of your might. And remember, remind yourselves of what's in it. So you can keep protecting yourselves because once the mountain comes down, you're going to forget. So keep reminding yourselves, right? In that ayah in Surah Baqarah, the immediate next ayah is, ثُمَّ تَوَلَّيْتُمْ Immediately then you turn back again. Immediately then you turn back again. How ironic. And in the other ayah, this is even more ironic, when the mountain is hovering above them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, خُذُوا مَا آتَيْنَكُمْ بِقُوَّةِ وَاسْمَعُوا And listen. قَالُوا They said, سَمِعْنَا وَعَصَيْنَا They said, we hear and we disobey. I imagine that. How crazy is that? There's a mountain hovering above you. Imagine somebody holding you at gunpoint. Much, much more subtle comparison. And asking you to do something. And you write in their face, if you really want to get shot in the head, you say, no. They're speaking to Allah directly saying, we hear and we disobey. But instead of crushing them under the mountain, Allah did something much, much, much worse. What did He do? وَأُشْرِبُوا فِي قُلُوبِهِمْ الْعِجْلِ مِنْ بَعْدِ ذَلِكَ then he made their hearts drink the love of the calf. Then though it's so irrational, illogical, it doesn't even make sense to worship a calf. It doesn't even make sense to disobey Musa. Their hearts were, the love of the calf, the worship of the calf was poured into their hearts. So no, no matter what their minds told them, their hearts were so diseased at that point, it couldn't help them. At the end of this, this detailed legacy of you know, Bani Israel, at the end of it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ثُمَّ قَسَتْ قُلُوبُكُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ ذَلِكَ This is what I want to come to. Then your hearts became hard after these events. فَهِيَ كَالْحِجَارَةِ Then they became like boulders, like rock. أَوْ أَشَدُّ قَسْوَةِ Or even harder than rock. Now rock is a natural creation of Allah. But when Allah says, أَوْ أَشَدُّ قَسْوَةِ Or even harder than rock, that's important to note, because now they became unnaturally hard. Because then Allah goes back to the analogy of rock and says, وَإِنَّ مِنَ الْحِجَارَةِ لَمَا يَتَفَجَّرُ مِنْهُ الْأَنْهَارِ From among the stones there are those who rip open and water comes out from them. Just like Musa alayhi salam struck the, you know, struck the staff and the water came out. So he gave a, you know, a pertinent analogy, something they had experienced already, that even rock, water comes out of it. وَإِنَّ مِنْهَا لَمَا يَشَّقَّقْ فَيَخْرُجُ مِنْهُ الْمَاءِ and some ulama say that this part of the ayah is referring to a part of the history of Bani Israel that is not mentioned in the Quran, but you find it in the Torah. It is that when Musa was taking them in 
the desert and he had commanded them to fight. Not only did they were not going to fight, some of them conspired, this guy is crazy, let's go get and kill him. So when they tried to go and kill him, the mountain underneath they were standing started crumbling and those who had attempted or plotted to kill him, among the Bani Israel, they got crushed and then all of them, the rest of them made tawbah. So the next part of it is, وَإِنَّ مِنْهَا لَمَا يَشَّقَّقُ فَيَخْرُجُ مِنْهُ الْمَاءِ That from among them are those who split open and water comes out from them. وَإِنَّ لَمَا يَهْبِطُ مِنْ خَشْيَةِ اللَّهِ And then from among them are those that they, they fall, the rocks start falling down from the fear of Allah. وَمَا اللَّهُ بِغَافِلٍ عَمَّا تَعْمَلُونَ Allah is not aware, unaware of what you're doing. Last couple of things I'll mention about these people. Because Allah gives that old, old history and then brings it back to the contemporary time of the life of the Prophet ﷺ. He says, أَفَتَطْمَعُونَ أَنْ يُؤْمِنُونَكُمْ Do you really think these people are going to accept what you're saying, O Muhammad? Or O companions, do you really think they're going to accept what you're saying? وَقَدْ كَانَ فَرِيقٌ مِّنْهُمْ يَسْمَعُونَ كَلَامَ اللَّهِ Listen to this carefully. And def- there was already a group from among them that used to engage in the listening of the word of Allah. ثُمَّ يُحَرِّفُونَهُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا عَقَلُوهُ Then they deliberately changed it after they understood it. وَهُمْ يَعْلَمُونَ And they knew what they were doing. You have the word of Allah. You change it because you don't think it's really the word of God. Something else. But Allah says they heard the kalam of Allah. And in Imam Qurtubi, Imam Ibn Kathir, rahimahumullah, both of them agree in this tafsir that there was a group from among the companions of Musa who went up السلام, to the mountain to listen to Allah. Had, they had requested that Allah accepted their request. And they actually heard the statements of Allah. And when Musa السلام, came back down and advised the people, these were the same people that said, No, 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 Allah didn't say that, you heard wrong. And they tried to correct Musa. السلام. ثُمَّ يُحَرِّفُونَهُ مِنْ بَعْدِ مَا عَقَلُوهُ Then they, tr- they changed it after they had come to an understanding of it. وَهُمْ يَعْلَمُونَ And they knew what they were doing. They had every knowledge of what they were doing. Why am I telling you all of this? These are extreme examples in the Qur'an. But again, we have to relate all of these matters to ourselves. I go to a Muslim brother who's you know, missing his salah. You know, he's, he's not, he doesn't come to the MSA, he doesn't feel like it's an important thing, etc., etc. And I go and talk to him because I'm Pakistani, I can talk to the Pakistanis much easier, right? So I go talk to him in Urdu and I'm chilling with him and I tell him, Ya, chill on the right? So you should pray sometimes. He says, Yeah, well, you know, why don't you pray? I don't know. Do you know that it's fard? Yeah, I know. Do you understand that fard means you have to do it because your, your master, your Lord said you have to do it? Yeah, yeah, I know. You realize that if you don't pray your father, you're going to get punished? Yeah, yeah, I know that. How come you don't pray? I don't know. I'm good. There's nothing wrong here because after interrogation, you're clear. He understands exactly what to do. Where's the problem? The heart isn't convinced. The heart is a little bit hard with other desires. Right? The essential disease described of Bani Israel at the end is their hearts had become hard. And the warning Allah gave, you see the Qur'an has a progression. The Qur'an gives you the, the stories of those of old, negative and positive. There are role models from the past and there are things, uh, pit, pitfalls not to fall into from the past. But then he gives you a universal guideline and then he gives you the contemporary example. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Hadid, for example, says, أَلَمْ يَأْنِ لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَن تَخْشَعَ قُلُوبُهُمْ لِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ Is it not yet, yet time for the believers that their hearts may tremble, they may become conscious Fearful from the remembrance of Allah. And from what has been revealed from the truth, the Quran itself. And they should not become like the people of the book that were given the book before. Were the people mentioned? Bani Israel. And the, 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 the Nasara, the Jews and the Christians. Right? A long period passed over them since their, the legacy was given to them of the faith. Then what Allah describes, the deterioration that took place, فَطَالَ عَلَيْهِمُ الْأَمَدْ The words used are, ثُمَّ قَسَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ فَقَسَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ rather. Then their hearts became hard. وَكَثِيرٌ مِّنْهُمْ فَاسِقُونَ And most of them are corrupt. You find this ayah in Surah Hadid. So now, what the, the warning Allah gives to the believers is, let your hearts not become hard like those before you. When over time, as the, the messenger was generations before, the more time that passed, the harder their hearts became. And most of them are engaged in corruption. Now I want to give you some one positive example before I, you know, or actually a couple of positive examples. What happens to someone who really has knowledge? 
in this society, in Western society, the more knowledge you have, the more status you have, the more recognition you have. Even within the Muslim subculture, within the American community, if you're a sheikh or you've got a degree from somewhere, you know, et cetera, et cetera, you have a certain title, you have a certain honor and respect among people, right? So your, your level kind of rises. And even if you're somebody who doesn't know much like myself, but people think you know a lot of stuff, right? And then somebody comes and questions what you're saying or somebody corrects you, you feel like, who's he to correct me? I'm up here, he's down there. So what does knowledge do? Necessarily, if knowledge is not attached with taqwa, knowledge becomes a means of arrogance. Knowledge becomes a means of arrogance. But knowledge attached with taqwa, you know what it does? It humbles you even more. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the people of knowledge. And the reason I'm mentioning this before I go to the Sahaba is, all of you are MSA students, in whatever capacity you're trying to seek knowledge of Islam. And check yourself, and I'll check myself. Before we knew whatever we know now, we don't know a lot, right? But whatever little we know, before we knew that, we didn't used to argue. And once we learned a couple of things, then it became that what we know is the absolute truth and what the others know is obviously wrong. How could they follow it? They're so utterly ridiculous for, for, for following what they're following. So what happened was knowledge became a means of disagreement. Exactly what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes in the Quran. Time and time and time again. وَمَا تَفَرَّقُوا إِلَّا مِن بَعْدِ مَا جَاءَتْهُمْ الْعِلْمُ بَغْيًا بَيْنَهُمْ they did not differ among each other. This ayah is repeated several times. For example, in Surah Shura, in Surah Baqarah itself, in Surah Al-Imran. They didn't differ amongst each other until knowledge, until after knowledge came upon them, baghyan, as a means of, of being the dominant one, winning the argument among themselves. This, was, this became their state. So knowledge became a means of arrogance. But the people of real knowledge, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes at the, almost at the end of Surah Bani Israel, Surah Al-Isra. Where he says, sujada." The people of true knowledge, the ones who have been given real knowledge, when the ayat of Allah are recited upon them, then they fall on their faces in sajda. Meaning it humbles them. Their initial reaction in the next ayah describes that they're, they're falling in sajda and they're in tears. Knowledge is not something that brings you to tear unless you're a, people, a person of true knowledge. Which means what? You have a lot of stuff in here, you memorized a lot of ayat, you know a lot of tafsir, you know a lot of sahabis names and all that stuff, right? But your heart is full of the knowledge of the deen, which is a whole different matter. This, is, this has very little to do with knowledge as we understand it, academic stuff. This is a whole other field, it's a whole other ballgame. So now when the knowledge was here, it led them to cry. Knowledge here, you can read a chapter or two from any tafsir, it's not going to make you cry. But the knowledge here, when the people of true knowledge, when they heard the ayat, their hearts were the ones that forced them to cry and fall into sajda. To say, وَيَقُولُونَ سُبْحَانَ رَبِّنَا إِنْ كَانَ وَعْدُ رَبِّنَا لَمَفْعُولًا Having said this, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha is cooking her meal in her home. She sees from the far in the window, she sees Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa coming towards her. And as he's walking towards her, revelation comes down about the ayat on hijab. From Surah Ahzab. And he's reciting them as they're being revealed to him. And now she's looking at him. So the ayat of hijab have not yet been revealed. So she doesn't know. She's not covered. And she's got her apron on. She's cooking. As she's listening to the ayat, you know what happens? She tears off her apron and covers her head. As she's listening to the ayat, she does this. How amazing is that? There were sahaba who heard. They were alcoholics. Literally, they were alcoholics because it wasn't haram. There's nothing wrong to, to say that they were alcoholics before it became haram. So they were drinking, they were, they were heavy drinkers. The ayat they heard as they were engaged in their drink. Most of us, if we found out, good believers, we just spit it out, right? You know what they did? They gagged themselves until they threw up everything. And then they went to the Prophet ﷺ crying, saying, Ya Rasulullah, there's still some inside. What do we do? And the Messenger of Allah said, that's forgiven on you. They were that concerned, imagine that. There were Sahaba, and I'll give you this, you'll find this a crude example, but it should be shared because these are our role models. There were Sahaba that were in the battlefield, many, many months away from their wives. And they had desire towards the opposite gender. And they didn't know what to do, because you know, you're out on duty. So either you, you, know, you engage in haram, or you, you know what to do. So they wrote a letter to Rasulullah saying, Ya Rasulullah, if you allow us, we'll cut off our body part. Because we will stay away from fitna. 
Anything that got in their way of obeying Allah, they were willing to sacrifice, even if it was themselves. Imagine that. That's incredible. It really is. The same way, I give you so many examples of what, what the Sahaba did, and you're like, wow, that's just amazing. You know, there, there was no time for questioning or asking. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they understood the words of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Allah gives the example, you know, with Musa alayhi salam, the Bani Israel used to ask, you know, I'm going to tell you a little bit of the story because I know I have limited time and I have a lot to cover. Um, what happens is there's a murder. And the Bani Israel get framed for the murder by some other guy from the outside. And he says, if you don't find me the murderer, I'm going to kill all of you. He brings his gang with him. So they feel the need to solve this murder mystery. So they go to Musa alayhi Otherwise they had no concern for who murdered or what happened, right? So they go to Musa alayhi salam say, solve this problem for us, only you can. So he says, Allah commands you, an tadbahu baqarah, that you slaughter a cow. So he said, قَالُوا وَتَتَّخِذُنَا هُزُوَا You think we're, you think of us as a joke? Are you making a joke out of us? We're telling you to solve a murder mystery, you're telling us to slaughter cows? What's wrong with you, right? Then he says, قَالَ أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ أَنْ أَكُونَ مِنَ الْجَاهِلِينَ I seek the refuge of Allah that I may be among those who speak with emotion, who speak without knowledge, who speak out of ignorance. So this was a command from Allah that when you slaughter the cow, you take the piece of meat of it, you strike it upon the dead body and it will rise. Now how did Musa alayhi salam talk to Allah, do you know? He used to go up on the mountain. It was a day's journey from where they were. So the first question they asked, they're like, hey, he's, if, if we're going to make play with this guy, let's play with him some more. So they said, you know, in, uh, this cow is confusing, come on, can you explain what it is? So he goes on a day's journey to ask Allah, Allah explains, he comes back, قَالَ إِنَّهُ يَقُولْ إِنَّهَا بَقَرَةٌ لَا فَارِضٌ وَلَا بِكْرَ عَوَانٌ بَيْنَ ذَلِكْ Right? It's not too heavy, it's not too light, it's not too old, it's not too young, it's just in between. فَفْعَلُوا مَا تُؤْمَرُونَ Then do without thinking what you've been commanded. Not وَعْلَمُوا Not فَعْلَمُوا فَفْعَلُوا فَفْعَلُوا is just immediately act. Stop asking questions, just do it. What you have been commanded. But they're like, no, 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 we're not, having, we're not done asking more questions. So they ask more, what color should it be? He goes another day's journey, comes another day back. He comes back again, oh, in al-Baqarah tashabaha alina. It's still too confusing for us. Go again and ask again. Right? So he, they tortured. This is why in Surah Saf, Musa alayhi salam said, لِمَا تُؤْذُونَنِي Why do you torture me? Why do you hurt me? وَقَدْ تَعْلَمُونَ And you already know that I'm the messenger of Allah among you. And related to this, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said that Allah likes for you three things and Allah dislikes for you three things. فَيَرْضَى لَكُمْ And he likes for you. As you know, I'll tell you the part he doesn't like. The pertinent to this matter. One of the things that he doesn't like is كَثْرَةُ sual, Too many questions. Take the instruction, act on it. Aisha radiallahu anha didn't find the specifics of what exactly does jalbab mean or what does covering the head mean or what color should the khimar be or what material can it be and what, you know, what's the fiqh of the matter, etc. Et she heard it, boom. Whatever the proper understanding of it is, the Prophet ﷺ will explain, but she's already responsible to obey Allah from what she's heard. So she had to act according to what she knew. She had to do that much. Same thing exactly Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes about the Sahaba. They didn't know that they could approach their wives during the nights of the fast. They didn't know because the Jews were not allowed to do it. Right? They were not allowed to approach their, approach their wives intimately. So they went and approached their wives thinking that Allah has not allowed it. Some Sahaba made that mistake. So Allah says, عَلِمَ اللَّهُ أَنَّكُمْ تَخْتَانُونَ أَنفُسَكُمْ Allah knew that you were being dishonest to yourselves. Even Allah knew that it's not haram. But you were still being dishonest because within your limited understanding, you thought it was haram. Right? So taqwa has a, a huge role to play in our obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And taqwa lies in the heart as the Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith of Muslim Ahmad, At-taqwa ha huna, at-taqwa ha huna, at-taqwa ha huna. Taqwa is here, taqwa is here, taqwa is here. The fear of Allah lies here in the heart. So, and the consciousness of Allah rather. So that's the example generally of Sahaba. But I want to give you an example of a youth in particular. This man used to dress the nicest, he used to look the nicest, by the mushrikun standard, if, if there was a GQ magazine then, he'd be on the cover, right? He used to get all imported clothes, his shoes used to come from Yemen. That's like saying he you know, wore Giorgio Armani suits, or I don't know who the, who the top designer is, they all look retarded to me, but anyway. So uh, anyway, so he, he wore really nice clothes and imported perfume and, you know, Mus'ab bin Umayr before he became Muslim. Very, very smart man, very handsome man, Many women wanted to marry him. Young guy, very smart, very intellectual. So even the chieftains were very proud that they have this man, this pride of their town in, in Mecca, in their household. He heard that the Muslims are being persecuted. 
He said, I gotta, you know, I was curious about what this Muhammad is saying, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Let me go find out. So he goes and sneaks into Darul Arqam to find out. He listens to a khutbah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as he's conducting a halaqa with the Sahaba. And he says, this is what my heart had been saying all along. He accepts. He says, la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. He makes salah with them. Now he starts coming to the halaqas regularly, secretly. He doesn't want people to find out because to find out in Mecca would be a big problem. Especially with his mother, Khunnas bint Malik. His mother was a very powerful woman. She had a, she had a very controlling personality. He wasn't afraid of anybody else except his mother. Didn't want to mess with his mom, like many of us. Right? We, you can take on anybody, but you can't get on mom's bad side. So he's sneaking in, and one of the, one of the kuffar, they saw, he saw him, and word spread and finally got to his mother. So they called a town meeting from his tribe, they pulled him in, they said, is this true, you become a Muslim, somebody seen you pray like Muhammad prays, and we saw you go into Darul Arqam, what's going on? He said, yes, I become Muslim. I, what can I say? He accepted, he acknowledged. His mother's first reaction was to try to spear him. She was that mad. Then to hit him, but she couldn't do it. She loved him too much. So what she decided to do was she tied him up and she put him in the corner of the house with guards watching him the whole day, for days. Many, many days, he stayed in his house, just not even being able to scratch himself, just tied up, because he had accepted Islam. Then some news came, he heard from outside, or some of the, slave, some of the guards were talking, that some Muslims are fleeing to Abyssinia, to Habasha. He heard about it, the next chance he got when the guards weren't paying attention or sleeping, he escaped, and he went with them to Habasha, he left his family. He comes back, and then he went back again, but eventually when he did come back, his mother caught him again, and she said, you better leave this Islam business, otherwise I'm going to tie you up again. He goes, you can do it, but whoever you hire to tie me up this time, I will kill them. And she knew he meant it, so you know, she didn't try it again. But then the least thing she could do, you know what she said to him? She said, you know what, this wealth you enjoy, these clothes you're wearing, these brand name and these imported shoes and imported perfumes and thobes and everything, this is not yours, this is from my wealth. Her exact words were, I can no longer be a mother to you. So leave this wealth. He's leaving his house, his uncle stops him. He says, you know these clothes you're wearing right now, they're from your uncle. They're from your father, your late father. So they don't belong to you either. Take them off if you want to stay with Islam. He, the man who everybody looked to for fashion standards, the guy who was like, you know, this, the, the, the most handsome man, the most respected young man in the society, had to leave his house covering his shame with his hands. He had to leave his house naked. This is the state of Musa bin Umayr. Comes to Rasulullah, gets some, you know, some garb to wear. And now he starts, you know, and totally commits himself to the task of Muhammad sallallahu learning the Qur'an constantly. He's sitting with Rasulullah sallallahu learning and memorizing the Qur'an. And he was one of the most beautiful reciters of the Qur'an. So now the six people come from Medina, and the Prophet has to send sallallahu alayhi wa a helper to go teach the deen. He has many choices. There are seniors like Abu Bakr Siddiq, Umar bin Khattab, right? Why does he choose Mus'hab? He's young, he's already shown his will to sacrifice, and he's a beautiful reciter, so he can bring people with his charm of recitation, even, to the deen. So the Rasul sent Mus'hab bin Umair to Medina. He goes to Medina, he's living with somebody else as a guest, and he starts going every single day, next neighbor's house, this one's house, that one's house, reciting Qur'an to them, bringing them to Islam, slowly but surely. And people, if they didn't come to Islam, they were mesmerized by the Qur'an, so they would come and sit in his gatherings. Which bothered the chiefs of the tribes. One of the chiefs heard about this, he got really mad. One day Musab was sitting outside in public giving the dars, teaching Qur'an. And he came with a spear and said, you better stop talking to my tribe or I will kill you. And Musab, young man, if anybody else comes up to us, you're holding an MSA meeting, some guy walks in here. You Muslims better stop this or I'm going to take care of you outside in the parking lot. Right? All of you like, oh yeah, bring it on. You know, this is what we would do. You know what he says, Musa bin Umair? He looks at this guy threatening him, and he says, well, why don't you listen to what I have to say? If you accept it, well and good. If you reject it, I'll stop bothering you. Which just sounds fair. Put his spear, stuck it in the ground, he sat down, and Musa bin Umair started reciting the Quran. Very calmly. And the man heard it, and he said, this is the truth. How can I enter this religion? And he became a Muslim. And then he said, oh, wait a second, I know a man, if he accepts, then his whole tribe will accept, let me get him for you. And he went and got him too. And before this happened, incidentally, this was the chief of a tribe, right? He comes to Musab bin Umar and said, what can I do to enter this religion? Musab says, you have to go take a shower first and wear clean clothes. Then come back. 
So he goes, takes a shower, comes back, and then Musab ibn Umar. Ibn Umar takes shahada from him, and then from the other tribes, and huge chunks, you know, of, of Medinan tribes start coming into Islam. So Musab ibn Umar was the, the, the trendsetter for history. What we have now, what the Rasul had as a refuge in Medina, was the work of Allah through Musab ibn Umar. This youth who decided to give up his wealth. In Medina, when the Prophet came, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, one time he was giving a, a, a khutbah, it was a dars, and Musab ibn Umair came and sat in the majlis. And a lot of people looked at him from Makkah, the, the ones that knew him. They looked at him and they looked down like this in shame. And a lot of them started crying. You know why? Because he was wearing a torn blanket. This was the man they remembered wearing brand name clothes and you know amazingly dressed. Nobody dressed as good as he did. Now he's wearing all of this only because he decides he's going to sacrifice all of his preferences for the sake of Allah. So some Sahaba even started crying. And, Musab, and Muhammad Sallallahu even looked at him and said, I remember you, you used to be very, very well dressed. Your family used to dress you well. They used to feed you well. And then the Prophet Sallallahu advised and, and actually congratulated the believers that Allah will give them kingship of when they will have different clothes to wear in the day and different, different clothes to wear in the night. And the Sahaba said, will we be better off then? And the Prophet said, no, you're better off now. You're better off right now when you don't have anything. Because then the love of dunya, what the Prophet meant, the love of dunya will enter into your hearts. In any case, Mus'ab ibn Umair, at the battle of Badr, his brother is captivated. He's one of the prisoners with the Muslims. The Rasul wasallam said, take good care of the prisoners. So his brother's prisoner and the Sahaba, they're eating food, they're eating rice and they're drinking water, and they're giving the same amount of rice and water to him. Mus'ab ibn Umair walks by and he looks at his brother, and he says to the guard, My brother, tie this kafir up tightly because his mother is rich, she'll probably give a good ransom to us. And his brother looks at him like, You're not talking to him, are you? You're talking to me, right? He goes, No, no, you're not my brother. That's my brother. His iman was such that he understood just like Nuh was made to understand. Those who are not in the boat are not your family. Those who fight against this deen, they're not your family. Those who believe with you, those who have iman and engage in righteous deeds, we will enter them into a new affiliation, a new family of the righteous. You're being indoctrinated into a new family. Those who struggle with you in the way of this deen. So this was the character of Musab ibn Umayr. But I haven't gotten to the real part yet. What how Allah honored him. How Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honored him. In the battle of Uhud, we know some Sahaba, and, we, and I'll say this, and please understand it carefully, made an unconscious mistake. It wasn't a conscious disobedience of Rasulullah, but it was a misunderstanding at the hands of the Sahaba. So they came down from their positions. You know the famous incident, right? Now what happened was the mushrikun, their target was to assassinate Rasulullah wasallam. So their attack coming down from the hill was targeted towards Rasulullah. Musab ibn Umair was a smart man. He understood this. And he was the flag bearer. So he grabs the flag, stands apart in the way of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, so to direct traffic towards him, and starts screaming takbir. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Why? So the people who are going to assassinate him would get their direction, attention towards him first. So people start coming towards him and attacking him. A horseman comes by, chops off his arm, his right arm, from here. He was holding his, his, the, the, the flag in the right arm. He grabs it in the left arm. And as he grabs it, he knows. Why is he doing this? His love of Rasulullah wasallam that he's willing to let go, right? Of everything, of his own life. So he says, وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ إِلَّا رَسُولٌ قَدْ خَلَتْ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ الرَّسُولٌ Muhammad is nothing except a messenger. Messengers passed before him too. So even though I'm doing this for the sake of Muhammad, in the end I'm doing this for Allah. He knew this, he clarified this to himself, even though he knew it was hurting him that the attack to Muhammad is becoming more and more opened up. So he kept reminding himself, screaming as his arm is chopped off, وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ إِلَّا رَسُولٌ the, the kuffar came and they chopped off the other side. Now whatever he has left of his arms, he's holding the flag like this, screaming, وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ إِلَّا رَسُولٌ قَدْ خَلَتْ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ الرَّسُولٌ They came and they speared him and he died in that state. And then afterwards, Afterwards, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala honored what was in his heart and he put this ayah in Surah Ali Imran in the description of the battle of Uhud. You find this ayah, وَمَا مُحَمَّدٌ إِلَّا رَسُولٌ قَدْ خَلَتْ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ الرَّسُولٌ 
Muhammad is nothing except a messenger. Messengers came before him too. Afa if in case he died, aw qutila, or if he got killed, and qalabtum ala aqabikum, are you going to turn back on your heels? Faman qalib ala aqibay, the one who turns back on his heels, falan yadurr Allah shay'a. He could not harm Allah in anything. Wa sayajzi Allahu shakirin, and Allah will soon reward the shakirin, those who are grateful. When Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam looked at the body of Umayyad, you know the, the shuhada were being given salams on the battlefield. These young men were give, being given salams by the, the, the because the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had instructed us even to this day that we're supposed to say salam on the shuhada, for they respond to the salams according to the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So the, the, the Sahaba that survived the battle, they're going around giving salams to the shuhada. They got to the body of Musa ibn Umayyad, and all of them started crying. And when Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa saw his body, you know what he said? He said, فَمِنْهُمْ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ رِجَالٌ صَدَقُوا مَا عَاهَدُ اللَّهَ عَلَيْهِ They are from, this is an ayah of the Qur'an that he recited when he looked at him. You know, we can recite these ayahs. But when these ayahs were recited by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa it was something else. He said, from among the believers are real men that have already confirmed their covenant that was made with them. That Allah had made with them. فَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ قَضَى نَحْبَهُ Then from among them are those who have given their due already. وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ يَنْتَظِرُ And from among them are those who are still waiting to give their due. وَمَا بَدَّلُوا تَبْدِيلًا And they would not re- replace their desire to give their due, to give their whole life to Allah with anything else. They would not replace it for anything. This is the ayah of Muhammad Wasallam recited upon the body of Muslim ibn Umayyad. As he lay, you know one of the reasons the Sahaba were crying? His cloth was so little that if you covered his head, his feet would show. And if you covered his feet, his head would show. So the Prophet ﷺ said, when you bury him, cover his head and cover his feet with grass. That's how he was buried. This was Musa ibn Umar, That rich, wealthy man. Why am I sharing this example with you? We're not in the battlefield. We're not, you know, we don't have to travel to, from New York to Habasha or Medina, right? To get away from persecution. But we have a mission, and it's the same mission as that of the companions. If somebody comes and says to you, no, 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 the companions, their lives are not relevant to ours. Because that was then, that's a historical context. We need to understand it, but we need to reinterpret all of these values in Islam. This is all garbage. It's garbage because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself has given them the certificate. رَضِيَ اللَّهُ عَنْهُمْ وَرَضُوا عَنْهُ Allah is pleased with them, and they are pleased with Allah. You want to be pleased with them? You want to be pleased with Allah? And you want Allah to be pleased with you? You gotta follow their model. How many times in the Quran, Muhammad Rasulullah, in Surah Fatih in particular, وَالَّذِينَ مَعَهُ And those who are with him. Allah honors the Sahaba. He honors the Sahaba in particular, like Abu Bakr al-Siddiq in the Quran, he honors him, calling him Thani Athlain in Surah Tawbah. Like he mentions a nickname for, for Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. But in, for others, he mentions them in plural, in general. And he, he gives them so many honors in the Qur'an that we can't take away from them and say, no, 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 this is just some intellectual discourse on the side. It has no relevance to how we behave. In this regard, I wanted to share with you the last ayah which I recited in the beginning of Surah Al-Fatih. Muhammadur Rasulullah. In, there are linguistic differences of opinion on this ayah, but the more dominant opinion, which, makes, which is consistent with the theme in the ayah is, uh, if you know some Arabic, Muhammad, Mubtada, Rasulullah, Khabar. But that's the, um, not the dominant opinion. The dominant opinion is Muhammad Rasulullah is uh, ism wa na'at ism, or mawsuf in sifa. Right? It's an adjective. Muhammad, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, walladina ma'ahu, and those who accompany him, those who are with him, ashidda'u ala al-kuffar. They are intense against the kuffar. They are severe against the kuffar. This ayah is so easy to read now because you could call Bush a kafir or this one a kafir or that one a kafir and you're harsh towards them. But you know what? With the Sahaba, their mother was a kafir. For many of them, their brother was a kafir. Their father was a kafir. Their own son was a kafir. How could you read this ayah and think of your own son to be harsh towards him? To be willing to kill him on the battlefield? What kind of iman does that take? Read Surah Mujadala. Read the end on your own. Read the end of uh, Surah Mujadala. لا تجد قوما you will never find a nation يؤمنون بالله that you that truly believes in Allah you are دون من حاد الله ورسوله mutually engaging in a loving relationship with anyone who intentionally resists Allah and His Messenger ولو كانوا أباؤهم أو أبناؤهم 
Even if they're their fathers or their sons. And the ayah goes on. If they're their brothers, their relatives. What is this? The love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took over everything else. Everything else. All their other relationships were defined by who Allah loves. In this regard, and again, I'm going to share the last ayah of, of uh, Surah Fath, the, the, the next part of it, but before I do, I want to share a hadith with you. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, Allah, Allah fi ashabi. Fear Allah, fear Allah in the matter of my sahaba. La tattakhiduhum araba. Don't take them in a matter of disagreeing among you or arguing among you or, or criticizing them or saying, this sahabi made a mistake, this sahabi said this, this sahabi said that. Be careful of when you speak of them. Min ba'di, after I'm gone. Faman ahabbahum, fabihubbi ahabbahum. Whoever loved them, then he loved them out of my love. Waman abghadahum, fabibughdi abghadahum. And whoever hated them, criticized them, then out of my hatred, out of my criticism, he criticized them. He was criticizing me. What is the product of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa His product is the human beings that he generated. These characters that he produced. What is the product of the Qur'an? The product of the Qur'an is these Sahaba. These role models that in the beginning of Surah, in Surah Baqarah, the Munafiqun are being told, وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُمْ آمِنُوا كَمَا آمَنَ النَّاسِ Why don't you believe like these people believe? Look at their iman. Believe like them, because these were what the Qur'an had produced. And this is why I wanted to share this ayah with you. But in, in the, I want to finish the hadith. This is in uh, An Tirmidhi, and this is related by Abdullah bin al baghdad the Prophet ﷺ said, وَمَنْ آذَاهُمْ فَقَدْ آذَانِي The one who hurt them, then he has hurt me. وَمَنْ آذَانِي فَقَدْ أَذَى اللَّهِ The one who has hurt me, he has attempted to hurt Allah. وَمَنْ أَذَى اللَّهِ فَيُوشَكُ أَنْ يَأْخُذَهُ And whoever attempts to hurt Allah, I fear that he will be seized by Allah. Allah will seize him into the punishment. This is the honor the Prophet ﷺ gave to the Sahaba. Now this is the hadith. Now listen to the ayah. وَالَّذِينَ مَعَهُ And those who are with him. Who are they? They're the, the Sahaba. And mentioned in the Qur'an. أَشِدَّاءُ عَلَى الْكُفَّارُ حَمَاءُ بَيْنَهُمْ They are intense against the kuffar. They are excessively merciful among themselves. You find the tafsir of this in Surah Maida. Al-Qur'an يُفَسِّرُ بَعْدَهُ بَعْدَ Qur'an explains one part of it with another part. So there Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَذِلَّةٍ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِينَ أَعِزَّةٍ عَلَى الْكَافِرِينَ they are adilla. Adilla in the Quran is used in negative terminology and positive terminology. Negatively speaking, it refers to humiliated, no self-esteem. And adilla positively means so soft that you forget your own ego for the sake of the one you're you're engaged with. And this is the meaning here in Surah Maida. That they are so humble, so soft towards the believers. You want to take role models of what Allah describes about those who are with Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The first characteristic. They are intense against the kuffar. They are excessively merciful among themselves. And the meaning of excessively merciful is adillatin ala al-mu'mineen. Extremely humble. Somebody's arguing with you, smile. Somebody's criticizing you, thank him. If he did you a favor. Somebody spoke behind your back, ask Allah to forgive him instead of approaching him and say, you talk behind my back, man? No, don't even go to him. Go to Allah and ask him to forgive. Ask Allah to forgive that person. Make dua for the people who have hurt you, not in their presence, in their absence, on your own. This is, you forgot yourself. Adillatin ala al-mu'mineen. A'izzatin ala al-kafirin. They are strong. They are uncompromising. They, are, they, they seem to show no fluctuation when it comes to the kafirin. Here I want to pause for a moment because I need to clarify what kafirin means. Because I know there's going to be a question. So does that mean we have to be like, uh, when I sit next to my class, I go, Ugh. my classmate. <laughs> And the Muslim brother, I, <laughs> you know, no, it's not like that. Al-Kafir in the Qur'an is a very important term to understand. First of all, terms in the Qur'an are not universal. Meaning one term can mean different things in different places in the Qur'an, depending on the context. Okay? Kafir in the Qur'an also means farmer. In an analogy, kafir means one who buries, like the, and literally kafir is the one who buries the seed, the light of iman. But kafir in Arabic terminology refers to a farmer, and that's been used in the Qur'an also. But here, kafirin, and in Surah Baqarah, just to explain this matter to you, usually you find disbeliever. And in English, when you think disbeliever, you think someone who doesn't believe in Islam. So it must be everybody else who's not a Muslim is, by definition, a kafir. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, and you probably know this ayah, beginning of Surah Baqarah, سَوَاءٌ عَلَيْهِمْ أَنذَرْتَهُمْ أَمْ لَمْ تُنذِرْهُمْ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ It's the same upon them. If you warn them or you don't warn them, they're not going to believe. 
If that's the case, then is there any point to give da'wah to anybody? If the Prophet is being told, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, even if you warn them or you don't warn them, they're not going to believe. And if kafir refers to everybody, then why is the Prophet calling to anybody? Because Allah said they're not going to believe. It doesn't matter if you call them or not. So kafir is not the rest of mankind who doesn't believe in Islam. Kafir is specifically, by, by virtue of, this is a detailed study in and of itself, but make it on your own inshallah, those upon whom the case of Islam had been established. They knew that this is in fact the word of Allah. They had no other place to go. Like Allah Himself says, فَأَنَّا يُؤْفَكُونَ Kaha ja rahe? Where are you going? Where do you have left to go? You've got nowhere to go. أَفَلَا تَعْقِلُونَ Why don't you think now? These are the people who after having no more excuses to go anywhere else, still out of their arrogance reject. Still out of their pride or out of their desires or out of their laziness, whatever it may be, they reject. These are the kafirun. And the only other category of kafirun that is definitive is the one who picks up a sword against the Muslim. If somebody picks up a sword against the Muslim, picks up arms against the Muslim, whether he was given da'wah or not, he becomes automatically under the category of kafirun. So we must be stern towards them. Somebody's running with you with a gun and you say, no, 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 we have to give him da'wah, it's to be soft. No, 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 not them. You gotta be a'izzatin al kafirun. You follow? But mushrikeen are different because in Surah Tawbah, which is the Surah of no mercy for the kuffar, even in that Surah Allah says, وَإِنْ أَحَدٌ مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ اسْتَجَارَكُ If any one of the mushrikeen come to you trying to find out what this Islam is, give them space, let them find out. حَتَّى يَسْمَعَ كَلَامَ اللَّهِ Until they hear the word speech of Allah. ثُمَّ أَبْلِغْهُ مَأْمَنَا Then let them reach a safe place, let them think about it on their own. Let them make the decision themselves. So there is a distinction, and there's the danger in just reading a translation is this, that we come to conclusions that aren't accurate, even in light of the, the Qur'an itself. So in any case, here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَشِدَّاءُ عَلَى الْكُفَّارُ رُحَمَاءُ بَيْنَهُمْ تَرَاهُمْ رُكَّعًا سُجَّدًا I'm sorry, I, I need to go up on one more tangent. Surah Hujrat, which is the next surah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives a character of the Sahaba. وَلَكِنَّ اللَّهَ حَبَّبَ إِلَيْكُمُ الْإِيمَانِ وَزَيَّنَهُ فِي قُلُوبِكُمْ Allah has made Iman beloved to you and He has beautified it in your hearts. He has beautified Iman in your hearts. وَكَرَّهَ إِلَيْكُمْ And He has made disgusting to you الْكُفْرْ وَالْفُصُوقْ وَالْعِسْيَانِ Disbelief, rejection, corruption and disobedience to Allah. He has made those disgusting to you. So the true believer is one when he sees haram, he doesn't say, Astaghfirullah, I really want to do it but I'm not going to do it. He says, Astaghfirullah, I am sent by Allah to get rid of this. He hates it. He's not tempted anymore. That's when, the, that's when you reach the iman. When you're not tempted by evil, you're actually disgusted by it. That's iman. Habbaba ilaykum al iman. Iman has been made beloved. Not kufr and fusuq and isyan. That's what, what's been made disgusting to you. And part of the manifestation of these two ayat together, you see, iman has been made beloved, and the believers who have iman have been made beloved. Kufr has been made hated. And those who stick on kufr have been made hated also. Notice what happens to you. I'm going to give you a lay example. You're on your way. All of us are on this journey to iman. We don't have perfect iman. But you know, for the men here, and you're all men, I'm not going to say boys or guys, you're men. Before you turned to the deen and you were, have, you, were, you were partying in high school or whatever, right? You don't have to tell me. I know. You Maybe you were attracted to some non-Muslim women or you know the way they dressed in the kafir way, in the fahsha way. But when you started turning to Allah's deen, you know what happened? They look ugly. And the sisters that are covered, and wearing hijab, and you don't see anything, they're the most beautiful thing you've ever seen. You're like, how did that happen? Allah beautifies iman. But they don't see any beauty in it. You say, well, what do you get to see, man? Right? But we, we see beauty in it. We're mesmerized by it. SubhanAllah, she covers it. I've never even seen her face. I want to marry her. <laughs> Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put that love of iman in you. So that which Allah has made halal, Allah makes them, puts the love of that in you also. This is from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are from the character of the Sahaba radiallahu anhu ajma'in. They hated that which was in disobedience to Allah. They loved that which, was, that which was in obedience to Allah. I want to give you one analogy. Sahaba would come to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what was one of the common questions they would ask? How much should we spend? What was another question? What can I do to get to paradise? How many hadiths do you find? What can I do to get to paradise? How can I get away from the hellfire? How can I protect myself from the jan? How can I, you know, serve Allah better? 
Tell me something that will save me. These were the questions. Go on an online forum for young Muslim you know, students or go to an ishtihad session. Is chatting halal? Can I eat this? Can I get a mortgage? Can I get... You see a difference in line of questioning? There the questions were, what more can I do for Allah? Now the questions are, what can Allah do for me? What more can He make halal for me? I want to make my life easier. Right? How can I build, make this into paradise? The people, the Sahaba were asking, how can I make the next life paradise? There's a difference of a paradigm. I would give a talk on, you know, sacrificing, giving in the way of Allah. At the end I'd get a question, brother, do I really have to have a beard or is it okay if I shave? Why? <laughs> Even if I answer that question, it's not the matter that, you know, we shouldn't get into a discussion. But the line of questioning represents something in your heart. You don't ask about something you don't care about. You care about these things. This is what your heart is preoccupied with. Our heart needs to be preoccupied with how can I get to the Jannah? What, what more can I do for Allah? What am, I, what, what am I doing for Allah? Is that enough? Have I fulfilled my obligations to Allah? What can I do more for da'wah? What is da'wah? How can I embody what was, said, what was given in the Qur'an as, as role models for da'wah? How can I better my salah? How can I give more in the way of Allah? What to give? How to give? These were the questions that were asked because people were concerned with building the next real estate, not here. They were concerned with the paradise. So now Allah describes what they look like. Tarahum rukkaan sujada. You will see them. Rukkaan sujada is beautiful Arabic terminology. They're in plural, raqi' and sajid. Rukka sujad. Okay. But now they are. This is sifa. Now rukkaan wa sujadan. Can you be in ruku and sajda at the same time? It's impossible, right? Allah says rukkaan sujada. They in ruku sajda. You see them in sajda ruku. He didn't say rukkaan wa sujadan. That would be you see them in ruku' and you see them in sajda. So what does this ayah mean? These are actually states of being, states of character that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is describing. You see them bow themselves down like Allah says to Bani Israel. Irka'u ma'ar raki'een. Bow yourself down like those who have bowed themselves down. You will find them that in Surah Hajj, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes the call to the believers. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu irka'u wasjudu wa'budu rabbakum. Right? Make ruku' make sajda and make sajda. You see in salah also, just by, by your shallow observation, you see that ruku' somebody who doesn't know what prayer is, somebody's humbling himself, right? But sajda, somebody's humbling himself a lot more. So what do you see? You never see them in a state of ghafla. Either you see them humble, your, humble, humble themselves, or you see them in even more submission. Either they're engaged in Allah's work, or they're really engaged in Allah's work. There's no other thing. Qiyaman wa qu'udan wa ala junubihim. Standing, sitting, or on their side. Lying down. All the time they're in the remembrance of Allah. The only matter is what the intensity of it is. But it's all the time. There's no weekends. There's no time off. There's no, like, you know, on Eid we just kind of like laid back after Ramadan. The ibadah is done. It's three days of just chilling and partying and PlayStation and whatever else, right? There's none of that because Rukkaan Sujjadan. Why? Yabitahuna fadlan min Allah. Beautiful ayah. They are seeking energetically. Ibtaqa yabtaqi is to seek energetically, enthusiastically. Fadlam min Allah, the blessing from Allah. Fadl means, blessing is a weak, you know, English word. Fadl and ajr. Ajr is reward. You know, you make salah, you expect Allah to reward it. Fadl is you're asking Allah to give you something you don't even deserve. Allah just give. I know I don't deserve. So they're seeking the blessing of Allah. More than what they've done, they're seeking the mercy of Allah. The blessing of Allah, what idwana, and on top of everything else, they are seeking His contentment, that Allah be pleased with them. This is the ultimate fadl of Allah. You know, it, it, this reminds me of the end of Surah Baqarah, I know I, I'm big on tangents, I'm sorry. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, at the end of Surah Baqarah, we are, made to, we are asked to make dua, فَاعْفُ عَنَّا وَغْفِرْ لَنَا وَرْحَمْنَا أَنْتَ مَوْلَانَا فَانْصُرْنَا عَلَى الْقَوْمِ الْكَافِرِينَ in the Arabic, if in, a, in a, probably in an average transition, you'll find, forgive us, forgive us, and forgive us, or synonyms of forgiving. And show us mercy. So forgive us, forgive us, and show us mercy. Well, how come, and all three of them have to do with forgiving, right? Showing Allah showing mercy. How come these three terms are used? Is lovingly overlook our mistakes in this life. When we are doing work for you, O oh Allah, we will fall short. Keep overlooking those mistakes, lovingly. On the day of judgment, cover our mistakes. Ghafur, the attribute of Allah, is to cover. Right? Warhamna, and show us mercy and enter us into the paradise. You see, on the day of judgment, the believers are described. 
that they are yas'aluruhum bayna aydihim wa bi aymanihim there's a light of iman the real faith coming out from their the front and the light of their good deeds what they did for the sake of allah coming from their right and they're in the dark they're walking towards the paradise but you know what that's not enough to get them there their iman and their good deeds are not enough to get them there so they say rabbana atmim lana nurana O oh, our Rabb, complete for us our light. Warhamna, inna ka'ala kulli shayin qadeer. And show us mercy, you are upon all things powerful. So in the end, you need Allah's light to get you there. This is why when they get to the paradise, they say, Alhamdulillah, alladhi hadana lihada. All praise belongs to Allah. All thanks belongs to Allah. Who guided us to this paradise. Wa ma kunna li nahtadiya. We could never have guided ourselves. Lawla an hadana Allah. Had it not been Allah who guided us. So these are from the, 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 the things I'm trying to share with you regarding the Sahaba is they were conscious of where they're heading. Everything they did had this outlook. You guys are in your careers now, you're in your studies now. Why are you in the study that you're in? Oh, I like it. Oh, what is Allah like for you? And you know what? One of the big problems I see personally, it's, it's a Christian disease in my opinion, and it's injected itself into the ummah. I really want to memorize the Quran. I really want to learn Tajweed. I really want to learn fiqh. I really want to study tafsir. I, 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 I. What does Allah want you to do? This question has disappeared almost. What is the need of you? What, what capabilities do you have? And how can you maximize them to your full potential? Even sacrificing what you might want to do. Because may that, that may not be the priority. That may not, not be the need. The need may be something you don't have a, you know, an, a, an inclination towards. But it's a need. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is asking of you of it. I'll give you an example. I hate talking to strangers. Personal example, I hate talking to strangers. I'm sitting in the train, getting the, you know, I went to Baruch to do some paperwork, I came back, I'm sitting in the uh, Long Island Railroad, there's there's a white guy sitting next to me, you know, trench coat, suit, the regular corporate guy, right? In the rush hour. And forty five minute train ride, I'm sitting next to him, I'm like, Well, I really don't want to talk to him. I really don't want to talk to him, right? Because he was cursing on the phone, et cetera, et cetera. I, you know. I was discouraged. But then I'm like, but then on the day of judgment, whether I like to or not, Allah will ask me for these 45 minutes. And he was a financial analyst. I could, I could tell he had a Wall Street Journal on him or whatever. So I'm like, what can I talk to him about? What can I talk to him about? I gotta find something. I see like a newspaper on the floor. I think it was the New York Times. Pick it up, open up the, the, you know, the financial section. I'm like, oh, I, I have no idea what financial market is, okay? There's no idea. Man, the market's crazy nowadays. He's like, yeah. It's just unbelievable. I'm like, yeah, start talking. 45 minutes go by. He shows me the picture of his daughter and how he left Catholicism and he's searching for the truth. And he I invited him to the masjid. He's bringing his whole family, inshallah, in a couple of weeks to, to come to the masjid. But I didn't want to talk to him. I didn't. What am I trying to tell you? The Sahaba didn't care for what they wanted. Even in the matter of deen, shaitan will come to you and say, do this, you're really good at it. Hey, learn to recite more. Take, take 20 hours just learning to recite. Forget everything else you got to do for Allah. So in the end, people, MashaAllah, he recites really, really good. You got to figure out what, you're the slaves, Allah is the master. So what you want to do for Allah is even dictated. This is what I'm trying to convey to you. And this is what the Sahaba understood. This is when they gave their pledge of allegiance to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa They said, Fil usri wal yusr, fil manshat wal makra, fil manshat wal makra. They said, in difficulty and in ease we will follow you. Whether we're inclined to follow you or we're not inclined to follow you, we will follow you. This was their character. This is what we need to really, really understand. Because the, you know, see what happened in Christianity and the continuing deterioration in Christianity is you, you go to church and the way they invite you to church now is we're going to have a, a, a dance party or we're going to have a festival or we're going to have a pinata or we're going to have you know, a, a balloon sale or whatever. They're going to do these, all these you know, fun things, right? And there, people come to church and they feel good about themselves because they, they had a good workout. You know, they were like you know, doing all kinds of things which make them feel better about themselves. So uh, Christianity to keep its audience, it's now what it's doing is not what you can do for God, it's what God can do for you. And that mentality at a much lower level at this point, and inshallah it'll, it'll disappear, it won't increase, is seeping into the minds of Muslims. What can Islam do for me? Or what can I do according to my inclination, according to what I want to do for Islam? This is one thing we have to be careful of. Because the, the mandates of the Sahaba were dictated by Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, dictated by the Quran. Whether Musab wanted to go to Medina or not, whether he wanted to leave the company of the Prophet or not, I would assume he loved the Prophet so much he didn't want to leave him. But he understood he had to go. So he went. 
Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, now I'll give you this example, of the love the Sahaba had for the Messenger Wasallam. He's sitting with Rasulullah Wasallam, And the mushrikun come and they start cursing Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, cursing his wife, cursing his sister, cursing his mother, all kinds of obscene language. He's sitting there quiet. Sabr. They said, Abu Bakr is not going to move like this. They start cursing Rasulullah and his family. At this, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq got up, enraged. As soon as he got up, the Prophet walked away. And he said, forget these people, why am I wasting time responding to them? Let me go ask why my beloved left. So he ran to Rasulullah and asked him, what's the matter? Why did you leave? He said, so long as you were sitting there, the angels were standing around us saying, Abu Bakr, al-haq. he's on the truth, he's on the truth, he's on the truth. As soon as you got up, they all flew away. And I don't sit where angels don't, are not in my company. What am I telling from this example, what am I telling you? Why did Abu Bakr Siddiq get up? From what he thought was the appropriate thing to do for Allah's deen. Right? But even that was curbed. You don't even decide what to do for Islam other than what the Prophet has instructed. This is the kind of sabr, this is the kind of perseverance and consistency we need to develop in ourselves. This discipline. I'm not gonna name you, you know who you are. Like, so what are you doing for Allah nowadays? Well, here they're on the side. Everything else is on the side. This is what has to be done. Your slavery to Allah has to be established. This, you know, your school's on the side. Oh, by, I'm on the side I work full time. On the side I'm taking 12 credits. What I'm really doing is I'm serving Allah's deen. This needs to be our prerogative. This is what the Sahaba were like. They, they weren't just, you know, entertaining speeches and they weren't just people that we just hear about and we say, oh, they're so great, what can we do? They had laser beams shooting out of their eyes and they were bulletproof. And there was no kryptonite at the time, so, you know, it's not like that. They were human beings. They, were, they made mistakes too. They made mistakes. And the Prophet ﷺ corrected them. They fell and, and then they got up and they walked again because they knew they couldn't stop going. They couldn't stop moving towards their journey. So we need to be clear on our resolve. I end this ayah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, سِيمَاهُمْ فِي وُجُوهِهِمْ مِنْ أَثَرِ السُّجُودِ you see the, the markings on their face from the, the impact, from the uh, consequence of making sajda. Some uh, sahaba were of the opinion that it is a mark that appears on your forehead from sajda. Some people in, the, in later generations, actually like the Shia for example, do this as a regular practice, a group from among them, but even from as a sunnah people did this. Just to become part of this ayah, they would put like pebbles on the musalla, and then when they go to sajda, like give a little rub. So over time they got a little mark here, it's like, ah. I got a guarantee I'm going to paradise. That's not what's being referred to here. Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Allahu alam, had the, from what I understand, the closest opinion. He said that this is referring to those who reflect the fear of Allah and the love of Allah on their face. And he used this from the hadith of Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, which is reported in Ibn Majah. I'm going to read it directly out of here. Man kathura salatan bil layl, hasuna wajhahu bil nahar. The one who exceeded his salah in qiyam, in the night that his face becomes beautified during the day. سِيمَاهُمْ فِي وُجُوهِهِمْ مِنْ أَثَرِ السُّجُودِ You will see the markings on their face, you will see the signs on their face from the effects of doing sajda. You will see them as people of sajda. You find, particularly among our youth, brothers and sisters, the more we learn, the more arrogant we get, the more argumentative we get, the, more, the harder to deal with we get, the more intimidating we get. But if we are people that are being described like the Sahaba are being described, then the more we learn, the more the sign of sajda should be on our face. We're humble. We're always ready to be corrected. We're always ready to be, you know, to be criticized. They were ready for it. Again, tangent. Umar bin Khattab radiallahu anhu. He's walking, he's a middle mu'minin, he sees somebody drinking in his house. He's peeking in. He jumps in the house. Breaks in. And grabs him. You're drinking in my, my room? You break the Sharia of Islam? And the guy who's drunk, he goes, well, I broke one rule, you broke three. He's like, what do you mean? Well, first of all, you shouldn't be spying. Right? Second of all, you should knock when you come in. Right? And third of all, you did dhan. You assumed that I was drinking. I could have been drinking anything. But you assumed from the look of me that I was drinking. Right? Stay away for the most part from dhan, from assumption. Oh, Bakr, Umar bin Khattab, Amir al-Mu'mineen, he hears this, lets him go, walks out. Leaves, doesn't say anything, just leaves. Head of state, open to criticism. Couple of months later, he's giving khutbah, he's giving a dars. And that man walks into the crowd, he sits in the back, Umar bin Khattab saw him. Khutbah ends, he calls him over. 
He goes, he goes in his ear, you know, I never told anybody about you. And the man goes to Amir Mukhtab, yeah, and I stopped drinking from that day. <laughs> but this was the character of the Sahaba. Even the way they corrected people were so beautiful. See, he, he had his anger, he, he went out of control, he realized it, and he stopped himself immediately. So the fact is, we will make mistakes, but who of us will acknowledge our mistakes and stop, and go back? So now, ذَلِكَ مَثَلُهُمْ فِي التَّوْرَةِ That, such is their example in the Torah. وَمَثَلُهُمْ فِي الْإِنْجِيلِ And their example in the Injil is, كَزَرْعٍ أَخْرَجَ شَطْأَهُ فَآزَرَهُ فَاسْتَغْلَضَ فَاسْتَوَى عَلَى سُوْفِهِ This, this e e analogy is that of a seed planted into the ground by the farmer. And when it comes out, it's just a little tiny, weak little, you know, uh, uh, object, right? It's like a blade. Then it starts strengthening and thickening. And it rises higher and higher. It becomes more obvious to others. Before you don't see it. It's like, you know, something you step on. You don't even realize it. But as it becomes higher and higher, people go around it. And as it becomes more beautified, flowers, and it, it, it comes to its full bloom, then it becomes a, a matter of beauty, particularly for the one who sowed it. If you ever worked on your backyard, I don't think you do more. Usually older people do that, right? When they plant a seed and they see the plant grow in a month or in a week, they're really proud of that plant. Who is the farmer in this case, in this analogy? It is Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. These Sahaba who were at that time nobody considered them significant. Nobody knew what their worth was, and even their development was taking place, right? But as the times grew, as difficulties grew, as the winds came, as the hurricanes came, as the storms came, and they kept growing, and they kept moving forward, and they kept moving forward with their development. Yu'jibu zara. The farmer is so you know impressed with them. So that the kuffar, the disbelievers, can be disgusted by them. You see in the Qur'an there is, is there's this tamthil and there's mumathal. There's the one that, the, this analogy of the plant is referring to the companions and to the Prophet ﷺ. But the style of the Qur'an in a couple of places is, at the end of the analogy, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will go back to the actual matter which was being given an example of. So at the end of the ayah, Allah mentions the kuffar directly. Instead of giving another analogy, to make it clear that the previous analogy refers to the Sahaba, refers to Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, as the ayah begins, Muhammad Rasulullah anyway. So now the yaghiba bihim al kuffar, so the kuffar can be disgusted by its growth, by their growth. Wa adallahu aladina amanu wa amilu salihati minhum. Allah has promised those who truly believe and engage in righteous deeds from among them. This minhum is very important. The Sahaba, we agree, are all among, except for those who the Prophet himself, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, identified as munafiqun. Other than those, we assume and we believe that they are all sincere. But Allah subhanahu wa taala keeps them in check even then. So He says He has promised those who have iman and do righteous deeds from among them, maghfiratan, covering of their mistakes, wa ajran adima, and a huge reward. Ajr would be what they got. Ajran adima, much more than what they ever could imagine. Huge, immense, great reward, great payback. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has promised to the Sahaba radiallahu anhum ajma'in. Now, um, lastly, inshallah, and I'll stop at this point, um, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa has been described in Surah Tahrim. يَوْمَ لَا يُخْزِ اللَّهُ النَّبِيَّ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مَعَهُ On the day when Allah will not humiliate the Prophet and those who believed with him. This is an ayah that should give us a clear understanding of the greatness of the Sahaba. Allah has promised that He will not humiliate those who stood with Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The only two ayat revealed on, uh, on the seventh heaven are the last two ayat of Surah Baqarah. In those ayat, the first entity honored is the Rasul of Allah. Amanar Rasulu bima unzila ilayhi min rabbihi. But who's the second entity honored in those ayat? Wal mu'minun and those who believed. So the Sahaba have been honored on the seventh heaven in the only two ayat that were revealed there. All the ayat came down on the earth. But this is at the incident of Mi'raj. Those ayat came. And even then the Sahaba were honored. So we need to take them as our role models. We need to study their lives to try to understand the level of commitment and sacrifice that they had. And then seriously try to analyze what was their mission and how did they go about it? What exactly was it? What, what gave them, you know, what, was their spirituality a means in and of itself? Or an ends in and of itself? Or was it a means to something? Why were they so committed to Allah? Why were they constantly being told to sacrifice and give up and remember Allah? In the middle of the battlefield they're being told, 
angels are with you. In the middle of the, the discussion of Anfal, there's a discussion, you know, disagreement among the, the hypocrites are raising this issue. And some, you know, Sahaba who didn't know too much raised the issue, saying, you know, we should get some, you know, booty, more than booty than, than the, the muhajirun are getting. Second ayah of Surah Anfal, إِنَّمَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ إِذَا ذُكِرَ اللَّهُ وَجِلَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ The true believers are those when Allah is reminded, their hearts tremble. وَإِذَا تُلِيَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتُ ذَلَتْهُمْ إِمَانًا When his ayat are recited, their iman goes up. وَعَلَىٰ رَبِّهِمْ يَتَوَكَّلُونَ And upon their Rabb, they put their whole trust. To, Im- to embody the characters of the Sahaba, we need to become a people of sabr. We need to become a people of commitment. We need to become a people of resolve that we will dedicate our lives to the service of Allah's deen. And everything else must revolve around this work. So inshallah ta'ala, I pray, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He give us the, the courage and the commitment to follow the legacy of the Sahaba radiallahu anhu I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He forgive our shortcomings as people that are trying to serve Him and make mistakes constantly, that He overlook our mistakes and take the good from what we have done and that He keep purifying our intentions and He help us to purify our intentions so no criticism or no praise gets in the way of us doing the work of Allah. That we only do work for Him and for no one else. If I have said anything incorrect, I ask your apology in advance. And if I have said anything good and true, it is only by the mercy of Allah. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Sure, if there are any. One at a time, please. Okay. He said fast, he said uh, basically fast, do what Allah has prescribed as a solution. He said something else too. Yeah, it was, I think it was remarry and fast, or fast. The whole hadith? In, um, I, I, it's the hadith, the, the nas, the narration is in my notes, so I'll have to give you another time, but I'll give you the text of it from what I memorized. Uh, Allah is pleased with you with three things, and He dislikes for you three things. Then He likes for you, and that you enslave yourself to Him and don't do shirk with Him of anything. And that you hold on to the rope of Allah altogether, wala tafarraqu, and that you don't differ among yourselves. Fayakrahu lakum, and then he dislikes for you, and qila wa qal, that you communicate, you pass forward that which you heard. Meaning you heard something and you just pass it forward without verification. Wa kathratu su'al, and asking too many questions. Wa ida'atul mal, and hoarding of wealth for the sake, for the love of wealth. These are the three things that Allah does not like for you. That they don't differ amongst each other, so they they remain united. Yeah. Oh wow, really? That's a problem. Yeah, that was a joke very recently. Uh, but I still didn't really know. Uh, so I tried, I think, uh, when I was like, when I was on the job, I just said, but I didn't know where I was going to come with it. What they were trying to Oh, it's, it's fairly clear. Um, it becomes clear from contextual analysis. So you'll find it in tafsir, like Imam Nasafi's tafsir, who's a linguistic tafsir, right? It's a classical linguistic tafsir. Uh, you find some mention of it in Ibn, Ibn Kathir's work, in Qurtubi's work. Um, <clears throat> there, this matter was of more of a technical theological discourse outside of the Quran. Are all non-Muslims kafir? Is everybody going to hell, etc., etc.? And there were like issues raised regarding it. But those matters are clear. Um, we're not talking about people's salvation here. We're talking about who to take as an enemy in this world. That should be clear first and foremost, right? To, uh, those have been made very, very clear in the Quran. 
Like for example, the ayat that talk about kafirun in the Meccan Quran are late Meccan ayat. Early Meccan ayat are just warning. People do this, people do that, you do this, be warned, be warned of the hellfire, and they will be cast into the hellfire, etc., etc. But kuffar as a term, and, th and their criticism as a people, specifically of the mushrikun, comes in late Meccan Quran, when they had sent their poets, and their poets were defeated, when their intellectuals had said, this is not the, the word of a human being, when there was no way out for them intellectually to go to anywhere else as the truth but Islam, then what Allah passed as a verdict on them was this issue of kufr, that they are, now they're in a state of kufr. Right? Um, secondly, kufar as a term to fight against and to take as enemy has been used in the ayat that refer to the battles. Such you find it in Surah Al-Fal, you find it in Surah Tawbah, you find it in Surah Ahzab, you find it in Surah al imran uh, Surah Baqarah also, wherever you have mention of the battles. So you'll find that they have been termed. So that's why I, I give you two instances. Now the beginning of Surah Baqarah, there's three categories of people, very famous, right? Disbelievers, uh, believers, disbelievers, and hypocrites. The classical hypocrites is the sons of Israel. And the contemporary hypocrites are the, the people that say they believe, but they don't really believe, right? Both of them know the truth. The, the Bani Israel know the truth because Allah says, يَعْرِفُونَهُ They recognize him, that they recognize their own sons. So they know the truth. And the, the munafiqun know the truth. And knowingly, if they reject, then they become from the kafirun. This is why when Surah Tawbah came down, Umar ibn Khattab's comment regarding Surah Tawbah was, before the Surah came, there used to be mu'min, munafiq, and kafir. After the surah came, there's only mu'min and kafir. What did he mean by that? He meant that the munafiqun, Allah has exposed them so much that they shouldn't be under any assumption that they're Muslim. They should be clear now that they're either on this side or the other. Okay? So this is, this is something that has to be... Uh, it's, a, it's a sensitive study, but if you study Qur'an as a cohesive text by itself, these, these issues become very, very clear. Um, you probably are familiar with the idea that there are several types of tafsir. Right? There's tafsir asbab al nuzul like Ibn Kathir rahimahullah, which is famous for a, a common audience nowadays. But there's uh, tafsir al rabt bayn al ayat. There's tafsir of the, the interrelationship between ayat and themes that are, presented them, that are presented themselves in different places of the Quran and how to take them comprehensively. And work on them has been done more recently than has been done before, though early work had been done on it. But certain issues weren't a major concern in Muslim civilization like they are now. So more, the, even traditional scholars have done more work along these lines more recently than they had done before. So it should be, you know, um, one of the, uh, the common, uh, I feel, mis misnomers is that you should reject any contemporary scholar, what he's saying, because he's a contemporary, you only refer to the classical scholars. Look at the content, not the person speaking. Look at the, evaluate what they're saying, what their, what their proofs are, how, they're coming, how sound their judgment is, and then make your decision instead of just categorizing, well, this guy is from here or he's not, he was born in the 17th century, what does he know? And this one was from 3rd century, so he probably knows a lot more. That is true. They, they did have more classical knowledge. But sciences, particularly Islamic science, also developed over time. And I, I just want to give you one example of that. The issue of the miracle of the Qur'an. There were divisions among the scholars of what the miracle of the Qur'an is. One category of them said that the language of the Qur'an is a miracle. And they did extensive work on it, like Abu Bakr al-Baqillani, for example, rahimahullah, right? Zamashtari, rahimahullah, um, who later became Mu'tazila, but that's a whole other story. These scholars, they did work on every ayah. Like they would say, how come this word is placed before this word is placed after? How come a synonym wasn't used? How come this was used? So they were, in their approach, they were in a sense atomic. Like they would look at each ayah as a miracle and describe the linguistic features of the ayah. Contemporary work shows how the surahs, how they're paired together, how they're like, there's an order in the Qur'an which seems random, is actually very schematic. And there's a flow in it. But this is more contemporary work. Work was done on this like, you know, 40, 50, 60 years ago by traditional ulama themselves. But that's still significant amount of work, which is an area of, of study that we haven't dived in, had not dived into before. So, um, just as, a, as a, a, a simple response, there are still things being said about the Qur'an that don't contradict our tradition, but rather enrich it. So that, that should be kept in mind, inshallah. Open-mindedness is a good thing. Yes. Say that again, please. Oh, 
It wasn't about that. Yeah. This is after the conquest of Makkah. No. Why are you going to bring up temporary marriage? You like can of worms? You like cans of worms? <laughs> Too many questions, please. I don't have time. I'm off duty. It's all good. Barakallahu feekum. May Allah accept our gathering for his sake. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep mine and your intentions pure. And may Allah remove any ill feelings we may have towards each other in our hearts. Jazakumullah for inviting me. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.